you have your Bibles, open them up to Genesis chapter 6. Again, we're going to be in verses 1 through 8 today. Bless you. Let me pray. God, we are grateful for you, for your word, for your truth. We are grateful that you, you are sovereign, you are in control. Even when the world seems out of control, we know that you, you are in control. Help us to rest in that truth. Help us to rest in you. And I pray that we will love you more when we leave than we did when we walked in because we know you more. And I pray that that love will show itself in the way that we live. Amen. Continuing our series in Genesis. So last week we were Genesis 5, Seth to Noah. We looked at the genealogy, and yes, the genealogy is useful, is inspired, is helpful. And we, we saw how sin infiltrated all of humanity, and he died. And he died. We see the, the toil, the way that, that Lamech named Noah, hoping that Noah would be the one to undo the curse, the, the hard work that God cursed. So we get into Genesis chapter 6. And Genesis 6 is really the, the state of humanity during chapter 5. So chapter 5 is the overview. Here's all the people who lived. Here's their ages. Here's their kids. Here's, and then we get to chapter 6. And it's kind of a, a behind-the-scenes look. Verse 9 is the next Toledot, the next genealogy, the next, and the, the genealogy of Noah. But between that is what's going on. Now this section, know that there is a lot of debate, there is a lot of theory, there is a lot of stuff that you could read, and it is very fanciful, and it sounds, some people think that it's like reading some sort of crazy movie script. And so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the different theories, but we have to remember what's being communicated by the Holy Spirit through Moses. It's easy as you read Scripture to get lost in the weeds. You, you, find, you find something and you wonder where this little trail goes and you go off on your own and you end up forgetting where the trail was actually headed. And this is one of those sections. And so we're going to keep bringing ourselves back to what is being communicated. So remember the background. Right? Creation was, was finished. And God said, and it was very good. Creation was very good. Man made in God's image. Man and woman made in God's image. Tell Eddie that I remembered the women too. Um, man and woman are made in God's image. And it, there was complete harmony. There was complete peace. There was nothing. No tension. No division. It was perfection. Perfection. That all changed in chapter 3 when Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and then gave some to Adam, and he ate. We saw how quickly sin infiltrated creation and their relationship as Adam looks and blames God and blames Eve. It's, it's your fault that I did this. There is now tension between Adam and Eve and Adam and God, and God pursued them and they repented they they confessed their sin in genesis 3:15 the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head this is the promise that god makes that he will make it all better it will be made right the curse will be undone and yet a generation later cain kills a his brother abel cain is jealous that God, accept, that God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not his own. And so rather than look at his own heart and understand the issue that was going on, Cain killed Abel. And when he's pursued by God, he doesn't repent. 
And so we have two lines. We have the line of Cain, the seed of the serpent, and the line of Seth, Abel's brother, the one who God gave, as Eve said, to replace Abel. The line of Cain, the seed of the serpent, the line of Seth, the seed of the woman. This is important to understand these two lines of people. Otherwise, it will be really easy to get lost in the weeds. So verse 1, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took them as their wives. They took as their wives any they chose. This is the first debate, the first set of weeds. Who are the sons of God and the daughters of men? I'm going to get into the a little theory on this. Some claim the sons of God are angels that saw that... Maybe I was going to say something that God didn't want me to say. Some claim that the sons of God are angels who saw that the women were beautiful and angels took the appearance of men and the angels then married the women and they impregnated their they're human wives, and thus you get the Nephilim who are giants and are half man and half angels, and they're like superhuman people. And it, it seems rather bizarre, because it is. And the offspring are the Nephilim. They are the, the mighty men of old. Now know this, that as we look at this theory, we are never given the definition of the Nephilim. We're never told who they are. We're just given a name. They actually appear again in, in Numbers 13. It seems in Numbers 13 it's more of an of a identification of an idea. Like the mighty men of old. The, the mighty men of old are in the promised land. But we're never given the definition. The root word means to fall. And so it seems as though the word Nephilim means the fallen ones. But also know that it never gives us a definition. And so we can, we can kind of have theories. Well, here's what the root word means. So here's what this could mean. What we do know is that we don't know the meaning. And so there's a lot of, again, a lot of theories. So think of this modern day parallel. A thousand years from now, somebody's in Afghanistan. And they, they dig up some record that says the seals killed bin laden we understand what that means don't we the navy seals went in they killed bin laden here's the theory that develops either afghanistan was on the coast and seals were very dangerous creatures or there were land seals also who were man eaters both are very good theories, unless you know what the word actually means, unless you know what is being communicated. So rather than go off on this tangent and try to figure out who the, the Nephilim are, what is actually being communicated? What is it telling us? There is zero evidence in Scripture that angels can reproduce. It is, it is one thing for an angel to take the form of a man. We know that that happens. We know that that can happen. The author of Hebrews says, you can entertain angels without even knowing it because they can take the form of man. And we see that, and we'll see it again throughout Genesis, how angels, or the angel of the Lord, appears to man. Taking the appearance of a man is not the same as becoming a man. That is the difference between the Old Testament times when Jesus came to earth, and the incarnation. There is a huge difference. One is taking the form of a man. One is actually becoming a man. There is nothing to tell us that when an, when an angel takes the form of a man, they, they have then the physical capabilities of human reproduction. We're not, there is zero evidence of that. And in fact, Jesus in Luke 20, says that angels cannot marry or be given in marriage. 
They can't reproduce. Like This is part of his argument with the Sadducees. You don't understand what's going on. We become like angels in that there is no reproduction or such activities. So why is this important? Because when we try, again, to go down the path of trying to understand who the Nephilim are, we lose sight of what's actually being communicated. And we, we go down this wild tangent, and we develop this, this weird group of, of human beings who appear again after the flood, which seems very weird if they were wiped out in the flood, as they should have been, as the Scripture tells us, all were wiped out. And we will lose sight of what's being told to us. So what is being told? Remember, after the fall, up to this point, the focus is on the two lines. The the believers, the Seth descendants, and the unbelievers, Cain descendants. This is the, the the most simple, scripturally supported argument of verse 1 and 2. The sons of God are the line of Seth. The sons or the daughters of man are the daughters of Cain. You have the the line of Seth, the line of Cain. Here's what's happening. You have these two distinct groups of people. And this is the issue. In verse 2, And they took as their wives any they chose. Why is this an issue? The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Well, first, the word saw should bring your attention or your memory back to Genesis 3.6 when Eve saw the fruit. She saw that the fruit was good for food and a delight to the eyes. It's the same idea that's being communicated here. The the sons of God, the believing line, saw this is a fleshly attraction. It's something other than spiritual. I was riding with some of my kids, I, I don't remember which ones, in the car this week, and the song came on the radio, Listen to Your Heart. And I, I I said, this is probably the worst advice that anyone could ever give. Listen to your heart is terrible advice. But this is what the sons of God were doing. Jeremiah 1, 13 through 15 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? James 1 says, Let no one say when he is being tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person, when he is tempted, is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James later, in James chapter 5, says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Lastly, Proverbs 16.2 says, All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Listen to your heart is not good advice. It's a sure way to get into trouble. John Calvin said the, the human heart is a factory of idols. And so the idea that we see throughout Scripture is that you're, you are able to convince yourself of just about anything. Our hearts are so wicked, are so opposed to God, are so fleshly, in the biblical sense of being opposed to God, that they are untrustworthy. And so these men, in Genesis 6, the, the sons of God, were willing to put aside their spiritual differences to satisfy the desires of their flesh. And so Scripture is clear, right? It is, it is clear. Following our heart 
is not a good thing. But that's exactly what the line of Seth did. They were unequally yoked, as the New Testament puts it. They were more concerned about their physical desires and attraction than their faith, and it caused them to fall away. Solomon, the wisest man who's ever lived, it says 1 Kings 11.3, Solomon's wives turned his heart away from God. So these men had offspring with the line of Cain, and it said that these are the men of renown. It's another set of weeds that we've, we've talked about briefly. But the word renown here means name. That's all. They made a name for themselves. These, these descendants made a name for themselves. So if, if we say that today, we don't think that suddenly there's like 30-foot people who jumped out of the bushes and said, all right, we're the men of renown. We're the giants. We're the, no, they're, they've made a name for themselves. This is who they are. They were feared warriors. They were killers like their father, Cain. Remember Cain's Lamech, that, that he was bragging because he killed a man, and he claimed for himself a greater curse, a greater protection on him than God gave Cain. He was interested in making a name for himself. We can speculate about who these men of renown were, but remember what's being communicated. Don't lose sight. So as we read Scripture, if there is a plain meaning, give it its plain meaning. It's telling us something. It's not hiding behind some crazy idea that you have to decipher it through a code and try to understand. No, it's the Holy Spirit used Moses to, to write this, and he's communicating to us, and the words have meaning. Because of this, Yahweh, when, it, when you see the word Lord and it's all capital, it's Yahweh. But said, my spirit will not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. There's two ways to see this. One is that this is when God drastically shortened the lifespan. And, and we see very few people who live to be past 120 from here on out. It's Noah, his sons, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, like that sort of, but it keeps, it keeps dropping. And we know that, that the, the biblical record tells us that at this time, human lifespan dropped drastically. But there's also a warning here. God's spirit will not abide with man forever. God will no longer postpone judgment on the people for their sin. And this is, again, something we see throughout Scripture he did it with Israel and Judah. He did it with Assyria, Babylon. He, did it, he will do it in Revelation. He allows sin to get to a point and then says, enough is enough. I'm going to address it. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to put an end to this. And we, again, see this in later in Genesis 15 when God promised Abraham that his descendants would return to the promised land after they were slaves in Egypt. And he says that it will be after the sin of the Amorites is complete. I'm going to let them sin until I can't bear it anymore, and then I'm going to address it. And that's what he is saying here. Humanity, you have 120 years to repent, to change. And when you don't, I will judge. It's a warning for God's coming judgment. Know that, that he will, as he did, execute judgment. He will not postpone judgment forever. This section, verses 1 through 4, really set up 5 through 8. So 1 through 4 is the causes of sin. 5 through 8 are kind of the, the consequences. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intention of his heart was only evil continually. Think about this for a second. As we look around the world today, we see, we see a lot of evil happening, a lot of evil being celebrated. In this time, humanity was so depraved, it was impossible to exaggerate sin. 
Every intention of his heart was only evil continually. My brother once said when we were growing up, he said, you always over-exaggerate everything, which is really funny, but that's, that's what God is saying here. They were so evil that everything they did, everything they thought was only evil all the time. And this is what happens when follower of, followers of God follow their fleshly desires and focus on the things of the world rather than on things of the Spirit. When they live contrary to Scripture, when the followers of God live contrary to as the Bible tells us to live and be and focus and worship the impact that we have on the world is dwindled and the world becomes more and more and more evil. This is what happens every single time in world history. Look around, brothers and sisters, at the world. And when we say, how did it get here? Look in the mirror. Because the church has lost its focus we have become so worried about fitting in in the world, about making people happy, about not offending, that we've lost the light. And as we've lost the light, the world will continue to go deeper and deeper and deeper into depravity. This is what happens when we live contrary to Scripture. And think about this in marriage, right? This is this, this passage. When you have an unbeliever and a believer married, first of all, that's disobedient. And two, their children rarely are, are children of faith. Rarely. And that's just the way that it works. And so that's a danger. Think about this in, in the world as, as we, as the church, tries to fit into the world. We end up with Romans 1, where it is, where God gives us over to our sinful desires. Oh, is that what you want? Then you, you can have that. The worst judgment God can give us is when he says, you want it, you got it. And that's where we are today. The other epistles, all of them are, are a warning to the church. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Brothers and sisters, it's easy to become enamored by the world and what it offers. It's easy to, to think of physical attraction of other people or, or lust or coveting or a simple desire to be accepted. Temptation that was given to Eve is given to us. Did God really say? Did God really say that's a sin? I was, I was made this way. God wouldn't, God didn't say it's a sin. It's not a sin. This is how I was born. Well, this is what I really want to do. Did God really, does God really not want me to be happy? Does God really not want me to be accepted for who I am or who I think I am? This is the lie that the serpent gave to Eve, and we lose sight of God's promises because we think that God is holding back from us or God doesn't want the best for us, or he doesn't know what's the best for us. And so we think that if we say something is a sin that the world likes, that we will push the world away from Jesus. When in reality, what we need to do is the world needs to know, because the world does know that we are living in sin, and sin is what makes us need a Savior. I was listening to Charles Spurgeon biography, right? The Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Pre Preachers, Millions, literally millions of people came to faith through God's use of Charles Spurgeon. And one of the things that he said was, you know, it's, you're, you're preaching or you're, you're speaking of the gospel is like, um, it's like a magnifying glass in the sun. And it's easy, right? So what you do, I'm sure those of you who are my age or older, when you were kids, you got out the magnifying glass and you shined it on your brother's arm until it burned and then he... But this is what he said to do. Take it and, and really hone it in and go in at the sin. Because it's when we realize we're a sin, that, that we sin, we know that we need a Savior. Now, there is a loving way to do this. There's a right way to do this. And there's a very wrong way to do this. What was happening in this time in Genesis 6 is that the people of the line of Seth, the, the godly line, we're so enamored with the world, 
with the physical attraction of what was going on, that they gave up their faith to follow after their own sinful desires. This is the danger that we all face and all of humanity has faced from, the, from creation until now. See, all sin comes from unbelief. Every sin that we commit comes from unbelief. We don't believe something about God or we don't believe a promise made about God. We either don't, we, we don't believe or we don't understand that God's way is better. And so we, we sin because we don't believe it. And so we constantly fight against our own desires, the, the flesh. But we must, we must focus on the Creator We must focus on his word, on what he has promised, and we must strive after him. This is the only way that we can get to Paul was where he said in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And this is what all of us should want to be able to say at the end of our lives. It's time. I have run the race. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. And so we get to verse 6. And the Lord regretted that he made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Compare this to Genesis 131, when creation was very good. He looked at creation, and it was very good. Here, not so much. The Holy Spirit, through Moses, again, is contrasting to us God's way and man's way. God's way, it is very good. When man took over and man did it their way, not so good. Good, evil. That's it. Man's way is evil. Only evil continually. Without exaggeration. See that it grieved God to his heart. It grieved him to his heart. The Lord regretted that he made man on earth. First, think of the word heart. Heart, when we say heart in the West, we often think of emotions, right? Listen to your heart. Listen to your emotion. Listen to how you feel. The the Hebrew, the Eastern way is not the same, right? It's not an emotion. It's your entire being. It's your thoughts, your emotion that lead to actions. It's what we call our mind, are you, your mind is this ethereal thing that, that is out there that controls it. It's your brain. It's your emotions. It's the way you think. It's the way that you act. It's, it's all of those things. That's the heart. It's, an, it's called an anthro... I'm going to say this right. Anthropomorphism. I'm not an English teacher. It's, it's taking a human quality and giving it to God. And it's describing him in a way that we can understand it. So the word grieved, it grieved him to his heart. Some translations say that God regretted or God repented of. The the ESV is better, but but don't think about it like regret, like we use it. right? To to regret something for us means that, that we wish we didn't do something. I regret that I said that. I regret that I did that. God does not regret in those ways because God doesn't learn. So if, if I regret something, it's because I've learned to do more, I've learned more and I would have made a different decision, or I learned that it hurt somebody's feelings, or it, it caused pain, it caused damage. That's why we regret doing things. God doesn't regret. God doesn't learn. God doesn't not know the future. God God can't regret. He can't change his mind. He wouldn't do things differently because he knows everything. He is across all times, all places. He knows everything. He is all powerful. There is nothing that God doesn't know that would cause him to act differently. So the Hebrew word means grieve, sorrow, mourn. And again, it's human characteristics that we try to grasp God's vastness. So we, we give him words that we can understand, but know that it is a small, a very small glimpse of what God is, is actually like. God is in complete control of all things, and yet he's grieved. How does that work? I have no idea. 
Like just so we're clear, I don't know. But we're told in the New Testament to not grieve the, the Holy Spirit. Somehow we can do this. God can be grieved. I don't know how this works. But Moses is communicating God's attitude towards sin. He doesn't like it. He doesn't tolerate it. He will judge it and all have it. That's it. So we get to verse 7 and 8, and it's a sneak peek of what's to come. God will completely erase all of life from the face of the earth. Brothers and sisters, God is serious about sin. It will be judged. Period. And so the flood, which we'll see next week, is a glimpse of the eternal judgment to come. But notice that because of sin, God is wiping out all of animals, all of the birds. How is that fair? God, you're going to kill all the animals and all the birds too? What, what did they do? The stain of sin has impacted everything. All of creation is impacted by our sin. Romans 8.20 says, For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. Our sin doesn't affect just us. Our sin affects all of creation. All of it. We are God's image bearers who have been given dominion in the, in the, world, in the world. And sin has cosmic consequences. And so we get to verse 8. But Noah. Remember the Genesis 3.15 promise. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. God cannot wipe out all of humanity because he made a promise. He made a promise that that he cannot break. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. If, If all of humanity was to be wiped out, God's promise would not be fulfilled. He has to preserve humanity, and he does so with Noah. But see how this is told to us. See, the Bible tells us that all sin... There's no one good, not even one. It doesn't say no one was good except for Noah. No, no one is good, not even one. And so the focus here is is better translated, God showed Noah grace. God showed Noah favor. It's not like God was looking around, thinking, all right, well, everyone's bad. Let's see. Uh, Noah seems to be less bad. No, it... God gave grace to Noah. Noah was in a state of grace. He, was, he believed because of God. The focus is on God's action. God gave Noah grace. Noah received it. Noah did not earn it. There is a big difference. Grace cannot be earned. So as we close this section, let us be reminded we cannot earn God's favor. You cannot earn God's favor. So stop trying. If you are trying to earn God's favor, if you are trying to earn his love, stop trying. God did the work for us. Grace is not grace if you earn it. He did the work. Sin infiltrated all of humanity. None is exempt. Not one of us is exempt. There is no one righteous, not even one. Because of this, judgment is coming. Eternal judgment is coming. And yet we see Genesis 3.15, the serpent. The serpent's head will be crushed by the seed of the woman. We know that's Jesus. God will make everything right. God did make everything right. When you look around the world and you are discouraged, and you are disheartened by the, by the prevalence of sin, look at the cross. Look at the empty tomb. And know that it is finished. He defeated the serpent. He crushed his head. Do not lose sight of this promise. We know that the promise was fulfilled in Jesus. On the cross and when he walked out of the grave. He makes all things new. He undoes the curse. The curse is undone. 
because he has taken the judgment for our sin upon himself on the cross. And when he walked out of the grave, he conquered sin and death, and he undid the curse. We do not have a faith that says, do this to be loved by God. We do not have a faith that says, do to be. We have a faith that says, be because you are. You are loved by God. You have been. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have repented, you have been adopted into his family. You are a child of God. We don't have a faith that says, earn it. We have a faith that says, it's given to you. Take it and live. Only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved.